Nicholas Froyard. So family holidays were always an intense big deal in my house. My mom would make a gorgeous meal and there'd be lots of presents and a lot of time spent together in front of the fire. I think part of the reason was that my dad had married late. He didn't have me until he was 46 and so he had really looked forward to you know these kind of moments of domestic bliss um, for a long time. Uh, but the other thing was that it was always just us, just my mother, my father, my brother Todd and me. We had no extended family to speak of. Um, my mom's parents had both died by the time she was 20, and her brother and sister lived very different lives in faraway places. On my dad's side, his father had also passed away long before I was born, but his mother and his two sisters actually lived pretty close. They were in New York City, which was about an hour from where we were living in Connecticut, um, in Fairfield, Connecticut, actually. But uh, except for one visit that they, my, one of my aunts and my grandmother made out when I was seven, we never saw them. And when I'd ask my dad about it, he would say, well, you know, they don't interest me. Uh, <laughs> which I, I heard him say about various neighbors and some, some um, parents of classmates and you know, people who weren't smart enough or sophisticated enough. And I knew that both of his parents just had eighth grade educations and he'd grown up very working class. So this answer, you know, kind of made sense. Um, but it did seem like a rather, you know, cold feeling to have about your own family. But he was never cold with us. Um, he was always incredibly demonstrative and, and always saying, I love you, and, and very present. Actually, he worked at home. He was a little too present um, at times for my liking. But uh, so I really didn't worry about it so much. So anyway, one year, in 1979, I was 12, uh, my dad decided that he wanted to get my mom something really special for Mother's Day. He wanted to get her something from Tiffany's. So he'd always consult with me about what kind of gift to get her. And actually, he would consult with me about virtually everything. He would even read aloud. He was a book reviewer for the New York Times for many years, and he would read aloud his reviews. Um, so I, I later realized, I'm a writer now myself, that you know, it helps to read aloud. You can kind of hear if, if a line is working or not. But you know, I thought it was his 12-year editor. Um, anyway, uh, but he always took my feedback really seriously, especially when it came to things around my mother. So he brought home a catalog from Tiffany's, and uh, we spent an evening in his study before dinner looking through it. And he really liked these gold earrings that were shaped like sea urchins. And I thought they were kind of conventional. <laughs> they, uh, they looked to me like the kind of thing like some of the ladies at the country club would wear. And my mom was a lot younger and hipper than that. She was only 40, and she was a modern dancer. But I could see that my dad was sort of reaching for this particular kind of message with this gift. You know, something about like respectability and tradition, you know, the kind of gift that would come in that bright blue Tiffany's box. So I gave him the thumbs up. So Mother's Day arrives and we head down into the kitchen for my dad to present his gift. And uh, he sits down and he puts the blue box on the kitchen table. Uh, but my mom doesn't see, she's got her back to us because she's standing at the stove, you know, making dinner. <laughs> because uh, even though it was her day, you know, nobody else had come forward to make that glorious meal. And, um, and a weird peculiarity of my family's finances, or really a necessity of our finances, is that, is that we never went out to eat. Um, so she's, you know, at the stove cooking and he says, hey, come and sit down for a second. And she says, well, hold on a minute, I I'm making dinner. And he, he says, uh, and she still hasn't turned around, so she doesn't see this gift on the table. And he says, well, just, you know, turn off the stove for a minute and sit down. And then she says, you know, I can't turn off the stove. I'm in the middle of making this sauce. And I, I, she was talking about egg yolks. I think she was actually making a hollandaise sauce or something. And, um, and so he says, well, fine then. And she finally turns around. But she, she still doesn't see the gift because now he's got it in his hand. And he throws it across the kitchen floor. And it lands at her feet. And he yells, happy Mother's Day, and storms out of the room. And she looks at me like, I don't know where that came from. Um, so anyway, needless to say, the, oh, by the way, she wanted me to tell you all for the record that she did really like the earrings in the end. <laughs> but, um, but that night was, um, she's, she's not here tonight, um, unfortunately, but that night was pretty much ruined. And uh, so I go to bed, and I'd been asleep for a couple of hours, and my mom bursts into my room. And she wakes me, and I bolt up in bed, you know, I'm expecting her to say, like, the house is on fire or something, and she's like, Bussy, Bussy, 
where's the baloney? What? She's like, where's the baloney? Your father can't find his baloney. And uh, every night before my dad went to bed, he would have a bologna and cheddar cheese sandwich on rye bread, washed down with a single beer. And I had uh, <laughs> helped my mom put the groceries away that day. I was like, I don't know, it's in the fridge. She said, where in the fridge? Do you know where? I was like, in the meat drawer probably. And then she went running back down the hallway. So I lay back down in bed. I was like, she's woken me for bologna? And I can't fall asleep again. So I go downstairs. After a while, and I find my mother in the kitchen, and she's kneeling on the floor in front of the open refrigerator door, and she's sweeping broken glass and mayonnaise and jelly into a dustpan. And she's crying, and my father is nowhere in sight. And the kitchen floor is strewn with bottles of ketchup and mustard and jars of olives. And I lean past her, and I see that every one of the shelves in the refrigerator's door has been pulled off. It's like, Daddy did this? You know, it was shocking and frightening. I had never seen my father raise his hand in anger before. I'd never seen him lose control like that. So my mom starts saying how she just can't put up with him anymore. I mean, the baloney was right there. He just didn't look, he never looks, and he's just so crazy at times, you know, and I just can't take him anymore. And, uh, and I'd heard my mom you know, threaten to leave my dad in the past, and, and it always left me sort of speechless with fear, because uh, as much as I believed that my dad really loved us, and I did truly believe that my father you know, loved me dearly, um, to my mind, you know, her kicking him out of his, her life was as good as kicking him out of my brothers and my lives, too. You know, he had that other family that he didn't see, and I thought, well, what if I don't end up being smart enough or interesting enough for him? So finally I managed to say, you know, God, what's his problem anyway? I mean, he got you that special present from Tiffany's and, you know, he wanted to be a great knight. And, and she looks at me like she has an answer. And I said, you know what? She said, well, you know, his mother died. And um, I don't know, it's Mother's Day and I think he's feeling kind of guilty. And I was like, Daddy's mother died? Grandma died? When? And she said, uh, back in September. I was like, that was nine months ago, you know? How come nobody told me? And uh, she sort of shrugged. She's like, well, he didn't really know her. I was like, oh, like that was my fault, you know? But, um, but she'd already said enough. And uh, so she sent me up back upstairs. She, in fact, I think she thought she said too much. And so I head back upstairs and I'm sort of unsure what to think about this news. You know, and I get into bed and I, I clutch my pillow tightly to my chest and I'm repeating over and over to myself, you know, grandma's dead, grandma's dead. I'm like, trying to work up some tears. Um, <laughs> but I, I didn't know her at all. And I, I never even had a grandparent, so I didn't even know what you know losing that relationship meant. Um, what was most upsetting was the fact that I had been cut out of this private moment in my father's life. You know, I couldn't imagine losing my own mother, and here he'd lost his nine months ago, and I didn't even know. You know, I wasn't even invited to her funeral. <laughs> So the next morning, um, my brother and I are watching the Saturday morning ca cartoons, and I tell him, you know, Grandma died. And he said, yeah, I know, that sucks. And I was like, wait, wait a minute, how did you know? And he said, well, um, I found another box of ashes in the closet in Daddy's study. <laughs> she was there next to our grandfather. <laughs> so, um, and... <laughs> That's how we learn things in our house by snooping. Um, so, and that's pretty much where my father's family remained. His whole family um, was in the closet. Uh, you know, <laughs> nobody ever came out to visit again, and they didn't really come up in conversation, and, and I didn't really learn the source of this bad blood between them. But we had a very cozy, domestic, close-knit family life. So, you know, I didn't worry about it too much. Um, so it would be another 12 years before some of this um, started to make sense. It was 1990, I was 23, and my own father was dying of prostate cancer. And my mom told my brother and me that there was some kind of secret from my father's childhood that would explain a lot and that we needed to know um, before my father passed away. And so she wanted us to all get together to hear this news. Um, but before the date that we made to meet arrived, um, my dad ended up having a, an emergency, a crisis, and he was back in the hospital. So the next time we saw each other, it was around his bed. And it was this horrible afternoon where he was having these just horrible waves of pain that were racking his whole body, and he was screaming out, you know, help, help me, help, like he was drowning in it. And uh, finally, my mother bullied this nurse into knocking him out with morphine. Um, so we all go outside, and we're kind of trembling, and, and my mom says, you know, I, I think I better tell you what the secret is, because it's clear that my father's not going to live that much longer. She says, well, your father's black. We were like, 
that's it. Because <laughs> um, we'd been, you know, we'd known for a while there was a secret, and we thought like abuse or some kind of crime or you know, and um, this actually seemed sort of cool. <laughs> and so we asked some questions. We we're like, well, you know, how black is he? I mean, he didn't look black. <laughs> So she said, well, you know, he's mixed. His, his parents were both mixed. They were Creoles from New Orleans. And in fact, they didn't look black either. And, and neither did his sister Lorraine. And that's why they had come out that one time to visit. But his other sister, Shirley, did look more phenotypically black. And in fact, she married a brown-skinned man um, who actually was an NAACP lawyer. And he later became the head of the NAACP for the whole western part of the country, which is why we didn't see them while we were out being white in Connecticut. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a happy part of their life, I'm sure. <laughs> but, um, so this did answer a lot of questions, um, but of course it raised many more. Uh, chief among them, well, you know, why? Why had my father um, been secretive about this? But the next day, uh, a tumor broke through the wall of his bladder. That's what had been causing all this pain. And he had to go into emergency surgery, and it looked like he wasn't going to live. And he did live another month, but uh, the trauma caused something to slip in his, in his brain, and he was never lucid again. So there was no chance to have a conversation with him about it. Um, and then he died. So for the last 13 years, I've um, had to try to answer the question of his motivation you know, on my own. And uh, you know, was it because he was born in 1920 in the Jim Crow South, or you know, his family moved to Brooklyn in 1927 to try and find work, and in his new neighborhood, the white kids had picked on him because they knew his family was black, and the black kids had also ostracized him because he looked white, or because he wanted to be a writer and he didn't want to be a black writer, or because he wanted to spare his own children, you know, the same the pain and confusion that he'd gone through, and and have us have opportunities that he didn't have. Um, and I haven't been the only one that's wondering. Uh, when my dad got this job at the New York Times as the Daily Book Critic in 1971, no daily newspaper in the United States had ever had a black critic on staff before, except for Negro newspapers, as they were then called. And it made certain people that had an inkling about my father's racial identity, particularly African Americans, you know, just crazy that he wasn't using this platform uh, for the race. So in fact, um, uh, Henry Louis Gates Henry Louis Gates Jr., uh, the head of the African American Department at Harvard in 1996, kind of publicly added my dad in an article in The New Yorker, and where he summed up his life as a sort of Faustian bargain, where he had forsaken his family and himself to some degree to further his ambition as a writer. And then um, a couple years ago, Brent Staples, uh, who's on the editorial board of the New York Times, also an African-American writer, had uh, concluded that um, my father was living a lie that had chewed and ground up his life, leaving him a lonely and evasive man who even his own children didn't think that they knew. But meanwhile, Brent Staples had never met me, so I don't know where he got that from. But, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, I'll never know exactly why my father made the decisions that he did. But one thing that I know for sure is that it wasn't coldness that he felt towards his family, as I expect, uh, as I suspected when I was a kid. Um, a couple of years after he died, I, I found an essay that actually he wrote and was published just a few weeks before that Mother's Day in 1979. And it was one that he hadn't run by me. And uh, it was an essay in defense of irrational behavior on the part of parents. You know, if parents don't act crazy sometimes, where are we going to get our poets and our novelists from? <laughs> was his point. He, but it was really kind of a meditation about his relationship to his own parents and his childhood. And he wrote, uh, like every great tradition, my family had to die before I realized how much I missed them and what they meant to me. And he wondered, now that he had two kids himself, you know, how we would regard him when we were grown. And then he wrote, do they understand that after all these years of running away from home, I am still trying to get back 